Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the QC FY21 Earnings Conference Call of Dishman Carbogen Amsis Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Arvid Piaz, Global Managing Director, Dishman Carbogen Amsis Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, moderator. Dear all, welcome to the Q3 phone call of DCAL. The progress of the company is going very well. The performance at a global level has been truly commendable even in such difficult and challenging times. Starting with India, the company with its 50% less resources has been able to achieve a spectacular progress. As mentioned earlier, the CAPA submitted for EDPM observations has been accepted by the EDPM. The progress on the CAPA has been challenging with limited resources, but the team has been working day and night to make sure that we are on track. This gives us the management a lot of uh, proudness and, uh, uh, and, and for our people of their courage, dedication, loyalty, uh, and faith towards the company. We have been able to successfully take on board globally renowned consultants to help with not only the CAPA, but also with the upgrades that the company wishes to do to bring its capability to the next level. Just to give a gist of the fields that we are taking consultation in are the likes of engineering, information technology, and quality, where the people provided by these consultants are working very well with the in-house teams, increasing a lot of knowledge on both sides and hence the progress of the company. We also know that working with consultants forever is not a sustainable model, and hence we have tied up with two of the top five recruitment companies of the country to help us get the level of manpower that we wish and desire for. On the customer front, we have been able to now successfully complete the risk assessments of all the products and their customers. We did two virtual audit requests by two of the biggest customers of Cramps, and the audit went very well. They are extremely happy with our support and progress, for which reason we are going to push for uh, approval with the local authorities and with confidence. Once the approval is obtained from the these authorities, the work will resume in full force. Uh, with them and will be non-stop since they have been not supplied any material for almost a year. We expect this to happen in the next two, three months. We will also safely assume that uh, once the local authorities give their approval, majority of the work, uh, particularly related to CRAM, should resume uh, with most of the customers. We have not received a single recall request or anything negative from the customers and all the regulators of all the risk assessments we provided for the API sold in the previous years. We wish and hope that you all appreciate the mammoth task done and achieved by limited people of the company. We as the management felt that uh, this is truly extraordinary. All in all for India, we, have, uh, we are confident that we will come out of this with flying colors. For Swiss, we are on track with achieving possibly the highest revenue in the history of the company. Netherlands too, after one of its major customers opened its own uh, cholesterol facility, has been able to not only close the gap, but achieve beyond what was forecasted. China, you, like all of us, would be happy and relieved to know that it has turned into a profit after a long, long, long time. We are very proud and uh, hope that you all see the same. Jita is doing well uh, and is on track. Negative is only because on the account of depreciation and nothing to be alarmed about. France, we have been able to achieve the first milestone for the, uh, 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 for the expansion we wish to make, which is the ground building ceremony. We are extremely excited of its future. Last from my side, then I will hand the call to Mark and uh, Harshil to give you the details of the summary I provided is that in Switzerland, we had an overwhelming response from the bank syndicate that was formed. Uh, our first phase of the two phases in which we'll be raising funds 
uh, first paid was uh, 90 million Swiss francs, got oversubscribed by three times. We felt truly proud of the trust and the belief put in by the banks who are extremely conservative. And with that, uh, I would like to hand over the call to Mark. Thanks, Arthur. Bye. Um, so just, just expanding a little bit on what Arthur has, uh, has, has explained to us this, this afternoon. Um, India Operations now is starting at the Babla site to really gain some headway in terms of manufacturing, uh, getting back into uh, getting back into our, our mode of operation for a new mode of operation for supplying our, our customers. And we've had a couple of successful audits, uh, which is uh, a really good um, stimulation for the team in Babla who have worked uh, incredibly hard to uh, bring us out of the uh, EDQM challenges. We've still got work to do, but uh, the steps we're taking are being validated by the audits that have been carried out by our customers and products are starting to flow. So uh, we're working with a Swiss company at the moment manufacturing a very complex intermediate for one of their APIs. That's due to be delivered any day now. Um, one of the critical intermediates to enable the Swiss manufacturing units to finalize an API for one of our long-standing customers is now substantially underway and the product should be delivered to Switzerland by the end of this quarter that we're sat in now. Uh, plus all the other activities that are going on. Um, Naroda, the, uh, the site where we make a lot of our marketed molecules like disinfectants and crops, has been working um, incredibly hard to the point where we're proud to say that this organization has delivered over 300 metric tons of disinfectant and antimicrobial products to the world in the fight against COVID. And that is an incredible achievement um, for the Naroda site. And uh, we're very proud of those guys there as well. Moving out of India to the rest of the world, um, we continue to follow the trajectory that we've been talking about all year with uh, Carbogen Amsis. Uh, we are continuing to commercialize products at a rate which is at least the same or even a little bit higher than we've been projecting. We have a number of key projects that have hit key milestones in the last quarter or the quarter that we've reported. Um, and we can give you some a little bit of detail on those, which I believe is in the investor pack anyway. But uh, one of the key products, which is uh, a linker and a payload for an oncology ABC, for a, an Asian far, a far Eastern company um, was finally concluded in terms of its validation at the site. So that means that we will be uh, looking at the next delivery of that product will actually be our first commercial delivery out of the site for that product. And that's a fantastic milestone for the team in Switzerland. Uh, we've also completed the validation uh, of a uh, hyperthyroidism product um, we're now working with the client to develop the supply agreement and detailed forecast for the uh, ongoing commercial supply of that API. Uh, and we've just had great news from our first full ABC. So this is a project where we actually make the linker, the payload, and we do the conjugation, and we do the fill in France. And they had their IND approved by the FDA. Uh, and that is a, a tremendous, tremendous milestone for our organization. Uh, and we place the faith that uh, the management has put in the people to develop our ABC offer. Um, three more programs have just entered phase three trials with customers. One of them is uh, for a large farmer based, a large US farmer, and that's uh, an ABC drug linker. We've been working on that one for a number of years, but that linker is a platform for a number of uh, new drugs that they're investigating. And we have um, two others for uh, small to medium biotech. One's an oncology drug. The other one is for hypoxia. We're not sure whether that one may or may not get accelerated review because uh, we suspect the client is also testing in COVID patients and uh, there could well be a benefit there, but we, again, we don't know. We're uh, reacting to customers' needs. So, all in all, I think, um, as Arthur said, the, uh, the the business is moving forward. Um, the team are working very, very hard on the sites to continue to deliver the results that we've uh, projected. Um, of particular note, as Arthur mentioned, is the uh, team in Holland, 
uh, that, those guys have uh, really pulled out all the stops this year and have exceeded our expectations both uh, from an output perspective and also from a revenue and EBITDA perspective. Uh, we still maintain very, very high belief that that business will continue to, uh, to grow. We are investing in R&D, as we've mentioned before, and we have some other um, decent news there on patents and things that uh, I'm sure we'll get into in the discussions. So with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Hashil and uh, to talk you through the numbers and look forward to a lively and positive discussion with you after that. Thank you very much. Hashil. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm sure everybody has had a chance to look at the numbers, uh, but just for the sake of reputation and further analysis, I'll go through the numbers uh, segment-wise at a later point, and uh, first of all, give you a snapshot of the reported numbers. Uh, our revenue from operations for the, for the third quarter stood at 463 crores as compared to 519 crores in the comparable quarter of last year. Uh, which is a degrowth of about 10%, but uh, that is solely attributable to the lower sales from the Babla site, uh, where now we are already seeing the, 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 the green shoots of the production of certain cramps products already starting. So in the, in the third quarter, we had two products that we started manufacturing from the Babla site on the cramps site, and uh, we have already undergone, as uh, RTB mentioned, two successful remote audits from the customers. So we should be uh, starting the production of other CRANS projects uh, pretty shortly. Um, the, the cost of goods sold for the quarter was uh, 85 crores. So that represents close to about 18% um, uh, of, of, uh, of the percentage of the sales. The employee expenses were at 224 crores as compared to uh, 192 crores. This increase in the employee expenses is largely on account of uh, the forex fluctuation. Uh, as you are already aware, most of our employee expenses, they, they sit at Carbogen uh, AG, so, and, and which is denominated in Swiss francs. So because of the conversion from Swiss francs to INR, we are seeing an appreciation in the employee expenses as, as compared to the last year. Uh, the EBITDA for the quarter stood at uh, 62.6 crores. Uh, this includes a forex impact of about 21 crores. So uh, the EBITDA X forex impact uh, stood at 84.57 crores as compared to 122 crores in the comparable quarter last year. Uh, the, as far as the segment-wise breakup is concerned, um, the, Swiss, the Swiss entity, uh, so, so we classify the cramps into three buckets, cramps India, cramps Switzerland, France and China, and cramps UK. So what we saw was that uh, cramps Switzerland, France and China had a very strong quarter, close to about 300 crores of revenue. Uh, for the first nine months, the revenue stood at 928 crores as compared to 803 crores in the first nine months of last year. So there is a growth of almost 15%, 15.5% uh, as compared to last year, first nine months. Grants India, uh, obviously because of the EDQM observations, as we have explained earlier, uh, the Grants India revenue stood at 20 crores for the quarter and uh, for, for the first nine months stood at about 40 crores as compared to 240 crores last year. Grants UK did a revenue of 24 crores for the quarter as compared to uh, close to 20 crores in the comparable quarter last year. For the first nine months, they did a revenue of 77 crores as compared to 81 crores, so it's more or less in line with last year. Moving on to the marketable molecules segment, um, where, where the, uh, the, the vitamin B business uh, contributes the highest. Carbogenensis BV uh, did a revenue of 64 crores as compared to 57 crores in the comparable quarter. Uh, and for the first nine months, it did a revenue of 189 crores as compared to 185 crores. 
The other is within the marketable molecule segment, which comprises of uh, the disinfectants, uh, quads, intermediate, generic APIs. Did a revenue of about 55 crores for the quarter as compared to 59 crores in the comparable quarter. For the full year, it did 144 crores as compared to 160 crores. So overall, the cramps revenue for the quarter was uh, 343 crores uh, as compared to 400, 402 crores in the comparable quarter last year. And for the first nine months, it stood at 104 crores as compared to 112 crores. In the in the Q in, in the nine months of FY20, uh, 1,125 crores. Uh, sorry for that. The marketable molecule segment uh, for the third quarter stood at uh, 120 crores in terms of revenue, as compared to 117 crores in the comparable quarter last year. For the first uh, nine months, um, it, it stood at 333 crores as compared to 345 crores. As far as the margins are concerned, um, uh, the France, the Switzerland, France, and China did, uh, did an EBITDA margin of about 19% for the quarter, and uh, it was a similar percentage for the nine months. For the third quarter last year, uh, that margin was 21% and 20% uh, for, for, uh, for, for the nine months. So overall on a margin front, we are more or less in line with uh, what we did last year as far as the uh, uh, Grand Swiss operations are concerned. Grand UK uh, this quarter was at about 21% as compared to 14% in the last year, same quarter and 19% uh, for the nine months as compared to 17% for the nine months last year. Uh, within the marketable molecule segment, Carbogenensis BB did, a, did an EBITDA margin of 35%, so again, a strong quarter on, on the margins front, um, as compared to 31% in the comparable quarter last year, and 34.5% uh, for the first nine months as compared to 33.8% in the nine months last year. In the other segment, uh, we had an EBITDA margin of 18% as compared to 9% last year, same quarter, and 15% for the nine months as compared to 10% in the nine months of last year. So overall, uh, it, it was a very strong quarter for all the subsidiaries um, uh, out of India. Um, as we see more revenue contribution from India coming through in the, in the coming quarters, we should see the, the revenues as well as the margins improving from here on. As far as the foreign exchange uh, loss is concerned in this quarter, as I mentioned, we had a 22 crores of foreign exchange loss. Uh, this was largely on account of mark to market uh, because of the US dollar Swiss franc movement. Um, and uh, in, in the comparable quarter of last year, we had a gain of about three crores. Um, so, so that's uh, more or less uh, the, the highlights on the on the financial part. Uh, the capital expenditure for for the for the projects that we are doing between France and Switzerland uh, up till 31st December, we had spent about seven million Swiss francs. Uh, this was largely incurred in the in the third quarter of financial year 21, and our net debt as on uh, December 31 was at about 112 million US dollars. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, hand over the call to Mr. Sanjay Mishnudar, our independent director. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Arkit and Mark and Herschel have explained, the key reason for a relatively lower Q3 is attributable to India, where the EDQM impact, uh, although the teams are trying their level best to come out of it ASAP, it's still taking its own time, but the positive green shoots, as Herschel mentioned. A couple of companies have already cleared the remote audit, and now the production has started in Q3, of course, with a little uh, lower than expected or anticipated uh, progress, but Q4 reasonably good level of production and sales are expected, but still, overall, as we had predicted in the first quarter after the March 20 results, there would be still, I would say, about 
overall 10% degrowth on a consolidated basis entirely attributable primarily to the EDQM thing. But from next year onwards, as uh, uh, we feel that from Q1 of next fiscal, that is FY21-22, the things will be near to normal, both in terms of production and sales from Bavla, and that should see that the company is back to its original track. Uh, the good part is that lot of efforts have gone in and lot of structural corrections have happened which will see significant long-term benefits. And that is where Arpit explained in the opening remarks that some very good internal progress has happened which will ensure that going forward such things are taken care of in a much, much better way and that should augur well for the long-term prospects of the company. I think Mark has already explained that what are the new products and what is the pipeline on horizon. So if we take FI 2021 as an aberration, I think from 2021-2022 onwards, we should be business as usual. Uh, I think uh, with this, I will request the moderator to throw the house open for Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. <coughs> To ask a question, you may press star and one. The first question is from the line of Ranveer Singh from Sumidhi Security. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for taking my question. And uh, appreciate the kind of uh, performance despite this uh, challenging you know, environment. Uh, so two things uh, I wanted to understand. In your presentation, uh, you have mentioned segment-wise uh, EBITDA. So just wanted to understand that in India, cramps, where have you booked this um, admin overhead cost? Uh, because against, uh, you know, 20 crore of revenue, there uh, would have been some uh, overhead costs. So uh, which segment uh, have you, uh, you know, presented in this uh, uh, presentation? Uh, so the overheads for India, that would be coming under the cramps. So the overheads will be split into two segments, grants as well as uh, marketable molecules for the India segment. Uh, so since most of the overheads will be related to the to the grants uh, part of the business, that would be classified under grants India. It's apportionment. It's apportionment. Okay. So uh, basically, what uh, have been the overhead costs there in uh, on quarterly basis uh, on India cram business? Uh, for India cram, the total overhead cost. Just a second, I think. It is actually an internal apportionment, but if you see the India standalone results. So of the, of the total overhead that we have in India, uh, about 80% would be attributable to the, to the cram part of the business. Uh, because from the Babla side, uh, which predominantly does cramps business for us, most of the overheads are, are related to cramps. Uh, so if you, if you see the India standalone performance, uh, which, uh, where, where the total overheads, just a second. Huh? Just a second, Ranveer. We're just pulling it up. So can you ask your uh, further question while uh, they are assimilating this data? Yes, yes, sure, sure. And the second one, on uh, uh, once we are uh, through with this uh, compliance uh, issue and uh, things are normalized, then would you be able to capture the same client uh, which we have been supplying? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course. We are working very hard for the clients and all the clients are extremely happy uh, with the kind of support that we have provided them uh, uh, to continue with their supply chain. 
Okay. Um, and and if you could uh, give update on the income tax issues which uh, cropped up uh, last last quarter. So what is the status there? So so essentially over there, uh, what we understand is that the investigation part of the process is already completed. So what we are uh, right now doing is uh, filing the, the tax returns for whatever years that they require. So that is something that we are in the process right now. Revise. So for, uh, yeah, so if there is any revision, you know, we have that opportunity if you want to revise something. Um, but, but that is the process that we are in right now. And uh, post that, uh, the, the, the assessing officer will do the assessment and uh, then maybe at least satisfied, we can go for an appeal, et cetera. But that, that is the status right now that we are filing the, the tax returns for the previous year. Okay, so should it uh, be clear by the end of this year? Uh, well, yeah, so the assessment uh, from the, at the assessing officer level uh, could take maybe another uh, 12 months time, 12 to uh, 15 months time. And then depending upon, you know, whatever, the, whatever comes out in the assessment order, you know, we would have a chance to appeal against it, uh, if at all. And that would be a process which would, which would then continue. Okay, okay. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Ranveer, uh, sorry to address your question. Uh, yeah. The overhead uh, on the CRAM side would be uh, close to about 52 crores. Okay, 52 crores. And the nine months ago. Uh, no, this is for the for the quarter. Yeah. Okay. 54 crores is for quarter, right? Yes, yes that's correct. Okay, so this is a part of other expenses. Other expenses is some 25, 26 crore uh, on a standalone basis. So here, here we are considering all the expenses. So this would be the other expenses as well as the, the raw material cost, uh, employee okay. expenses, all, all of those expenses put together. So whatever, uh, whatever uh, gets calculated in order to determine the EBITDA for the cram segment, uh, is all calculated in this cost. Okay, okay. So effectively, okay. if you see with 20 crores of revenue and about 50, uh, 3, 54 crores of uh, expenses, the negative EBITDA uh, for us would be at about uh, 31 crores. Um, but, uh, but it also includes uh, the forex impact, which is close to about 10 crores. Uh, forex oh, negative impact. Yeah, negative exactly. impact. Yeah, okay. okay. Yes. yes. Okay, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Arsene. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question at this time. The next question is from the line of Hiro Gonsali, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. And uh, uh, well done, despite the challenging uh, quarter for you. I have a few questions. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. 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 I, I, I. My first question is regarding the budgetary uh, announcement this year, where it has been said that the goodwill of a business or profession will not be considered as a depreciable asset. And there would not be any depreciation on goodwill of business or profession in any situation. So, and we, we have done, we have raised some goodwill via merger of uh, Carbogen Amsis uh, into Dishman. So would we have to reverse the depreciation availed what would be the impact of it? Uh, so thank you, Viral, for your question. So uh, still, you know, that has to be enacted into, um, you know, it has to become still a law. Uh, but, but from whatever we have heard uh, in, and based upon our interactions with the, with the consultants and certain senior counsels, uh, what we understand is that there are uh, two aspects to this. One, uh, the depreciation which has already been claimed uh, before 1st of April 2020, there would not be any impact on the depreciation on goodwill for those years because, uh, you know, the, the law is effective from 1st of April 2020. Mm -hmm. So, so as of 1st of April 2020, out of the 1350 odd crores of goodwill, uh, we had already written off, uh, 1075 crores. Uh, so whatever is the tax benefit, 
uh, or, or the depreciation on that goodwill is something which is already tax deductible and that is something that we have claimed for. The remaining 275 crores is something that uh, you know we will have to evaluate um, depending upon what exactly comes out in the law. Because for us, uh, you know, this is not just a nomenclature of goodwill. Uh, or it, you know, it is actually the underlying intangible that we have valued. So that would include the technical know-how, um, you know, uh, the, the the customer contracts, etc., where each of these intangible assets have been assigned a specific value. Uh, so essentially, it is it is not in the nature of um, you know a general goodwill which has been mentioned right now in the finance bill. So that is something that uh, you know we are still under discussion, and once the once it actually becomes a law, you know we would have to see whether the remaining 275 crores is something which we can claim the depreciation on or not. Yeah, but uh, weren't we supposed to uh, depreciate this goodwill over uh, 15 years? And we, I think, yes, we okay. affected we affected the merger somewhere around 2016. So that's correct. So the the 15 year period is uh, is for the accounting purpose. So under the accounting standards, we will be depreciating it in a on a straight line method basis over a period of 15 years. However, under the tax laws, uh, the regulation states that you have to depreciate at 25 percent on the written down value basis and uh, you know most of the goodwill is already written off as far as the tax books are concerned so what proportion of the already very high depreciation that we have in our books what proportion of that is attributable to this uh, particular merger 85 crores per year so so the total goodwill is uh, is close to about 1350 crores which is attributable to the merger uh, every year in the books, 89.8 or uh, yeah, close to about 90 crores is something which gets written off. Under the tax laws, it is 25% of this 1350 on a on a written down value basis. Okay, so that would eventually lead to a lesser tax outgo initially and then higher. That's correct. So under under the tax, uh, as as per the income tax books, you know we would have a carry forward business loss because there has been an accelerated uh, deduction of uh, of the depreciation on goodwill in the initial year, and uh, you know there will be a lower deduction in the later years. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, my next question is regarding the OFS. I mean, what necessitated the management to come out with an OFS at already such a low valuation for our stock? Any reason behind it? So, uh, so the purpose of the OFS was uh, was largely uh, to get certain funds into the company. Uh, so earlier, about uh, 12, 12 to 13 years back, uh, one of the entities, uh, Dishman Infrastructure, was a wholly owned subsidiary of Dishman. When uh, you know there were assets that benefits that were that were available. And hence, uh, you know, what we had, what uh, the management and the directors had decided at Dishman was that the next phase of expansion should happen on the SEZ length, uh, basis which there were certain uh, lease advances which were given to uh, to Dishman infrastructure. Later on, that entity uh, became a promoter-owned entity, and hence those advances uh, were showing as outstanding between Dishman Pharma, the Oswell entity and uh, Dishman infrastructure. So what we wanted to do is that uh, reverse all of these uh, advances so that uh, you know we become uh, more cleaner from a governance perspective as well, and uh, hence the OFS. So it was not for uh, the benefit of the family or the promoters, but uh, to, to get the money back into the company. So, so all of the money that has been raised has already been put back into the company. Um, so all the cash remains uh, within the within the business. Yes. So what is the total amount that you were expecting to generate out of the OFS? So the, the total the amount. Yeah. So our target was uh, close to about uh, 100 and, uh, 130 to 140 crores. We raised about uh, 87 crores. Okay. So can we expect uh, another OFS or another uh, uh, say a 
uh, placement of shares to somebody? Uh, well, uh, you know, it would be very difficult to say that right now. But uh, uh, you know, uh, only if there is a strong income from large investor, we might look at it at a proper valuation. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, right now there are there, there is not an intention, I would say. Yeah, this is what actually bemuses me is that, uh, I mean, our company is basically one of its kind company. There is no comparable peer to Dishman in the listed space. And I presume in the unlisted space in, uh, in, 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 uh, for an Indian company. And despite that, Dishman is not getting the valuation that it actually deserves. So what is it that is missing? What is the missing link between the, uh, uh, between the perception of the market and what the management is doing? Or what is it that is missing which is not giving Dishman the kind of valuation it deserves. Because, I mean, going by uh, my limited uh, study of the uh, uh, stocks, I mean, the companies in the trans sector, even even a, a coveted company like DVs does not have a portfolio like Dishman. Right? DVs is still a 60% generic portfolio, whereas uh, Dishman is a, a totally 100% uh, uh, innovator, molecule, mo innovator molecule portfolio, which poses, puts us in a very advantageous position. And it, in fact, it's a dream position for any company to, in fact, if anybody wants, any company wants to buy a Bishman, it would, ready, it would be ready to pay a, more than a billion or $2 billion, uh, even, at the current, even at the current financials. So what is it that is missing? I think we are here. You uh, in the beginning itself, you answered uh, the question yourself that it is uh, the one of its kind company, which is not being able to be understood by the uh, 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 by the by the invest the investors uh, in uh, our country, because the business is a long term business. Uh, our job is to mainly cater to the uh, customers where they come up with uh, an idea of a new chemical entity uh, to be made. And the, uh, as soon as we join hands, depending on which phase they are in, uh, it becomes a long journey to see some benefits reap, uh, reap out of a single, uh, uh, single product. Uh, uh, some good molecules take about eight to 10 years. Uh, some uh, some uh, weak molecules take about eight to 10 years to come to launch. Some good molecules can be as quick as uh, three years from the time they uh, uh, from the time they go to clinical trials to clinical trials. But this gestation period is long. We are fully committed to our customers, and hence we are uh, achieving what we are supposed to achieve with the talents that we have. But unfortunately, the investor community is not able to understand. We have tried our level best to make them understand what cram uh, uh, is truly meaning for us which is really not comparable to anyone in the country and only possibly one or two other companies in the globe, which the foreign investors do understand, but the Indian investors are unable to uh, as of yet. But our try is to keep performing the way we are and then hopefully uh, one fine day they will be able to get what the, uh, what, what the kind of business uh, we are in. Because you said it right, essentially even at a 500 crore rupee turnover of the company, uh, uh, particularly in India, if you say that uh, constitutes for uh, uh, billions of dollars for the customers in terms of formulation. Same if you uh, talk about carbon analysis, it converts into billions of dollars for revenue as a revenue uh, uh, for the customers uh, who are into formulation and doing the clinical trials. So overall, in the group, we are API manufacturers. Uh, at a 2,000 uh, uh, crore turnover, you can easily say that the global economy that is being handled by the whole uh, globe is close to not less than $20 billion uh, in terms of the customers. So, there is just to add very quickly a couple of things. You see, uh, you are right that from an investor standpoint, it is also a matter of performance. Now, what I, as I understand and I see, this year, Unfortunately, while if you see last year we were on track and things were looking up, this year this EDQM came and put us frankly on a back burner. But that is only not a Sanjay, my, my thing, question is, is just a short term thing. Sanjay, my question is not uh, particularly no, about. So, so I'm just 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 give me a moment. I yeah. think from next year onwards, if you look at the pipeline. What was the challenge is, are we ready with the right kind of pipeline which can give you a consistent, reasonable, 
comprehensible set of numbers. I believe that with 18, 19 late phase three molecules, and with lot of efforts that are being put globally, from next year onwards, performance will come. Performance will speak. There will be a consistency that you will be able to see, and I'm sure that uh, over a period of time, whatever is the gap between the performance and the perception, I think we should be able to catch up as a company. The responsibility is to be honest in what we are doing, to communicate it honestly. If there is a problem, to say there is a problem. We believe that from next year, everything should look to be normal, and time will uh, probably, you know, answer your uh, 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 question more directly than rather than making any promises from our side. But I'm sure if you look at a three-year horizon from next year. We should be fine. I think everything should look okay. But yeah, I think the problem here it is, it is basically what you understand about the business. There are very few who understand. That is the issue. Yeah, that's right. But, but uh, uh, the, isn't it the uh, uh, mission? The management take the prerogative to come out in the open. Maybe maybe uh, you have an investor meet where people, you invite people to Ahmedabad your plant. so that they can have a look at the scale of your operations the quality of your business because this 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 clearly, clearly seems to be a a very big disconnect because i don't find a single company comparable to dishman and then yet i see there is more value destruction than value creation that is what hurts i have been a long time investor in your company and that is why you know you can uh, perhaps we feel my, feel the pain in my words No, no, we do, we do, and we feel the same pain as well, and we absolutely relate to it. And politically speaking, the plan was to go on an educational roadshow uh, of the uh, for the company here uh, around India as well as uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore to rope in uh, 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 foreign investors. But unfortunately, when we uh, finalized on the plan, uh, we got stuck with COVID and EDQM and EDQM as well. So then that plan got delayed, but we do uh, sympathize and relate to the pain that we are feeling, and uh, we are as we are very confident to uh, uh, come out of it and become uh, extremely strong. Uh, and that uh, and we absolutely appreciate and thank you for the trust that you put in. And uh, we would also request in the future uh, we can connect uh, one on one to uh, uh, get help on. Uh, Getting an understanding of your perspective of how the company should be portrayed for a better understanding of the investors. Thank you. I would request Mr. Hansani to rejoin the queue as there are several others waiting for their turn as well. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from BAM Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, Harshil, uh, on the uh, India business, uh, uh, for the matter, I mean, by when do we see going back to the FI nineteen twenty beta numbers? FI nineteen twenty. No, no, no. By when? So next year. Oh, when? When we'll go back to the FI nineteen twenty? So I think that would be from the next year itself. I mean, we we were like almost two hundred crore beta business last year in the last couple of years, roughly. uh we hope to be a we believe that we should be able to get there all over again by by, by next year yeah so uh, so you can if you see uh, you know with most of this grand project grand project coming uh, you know back to normal we should be able because you know even right now as we speak we have orders in hand close to about 25 million to be serviced from uh, the india facility so those orders we are expecting to be uh, to, to be served over the next uh, 12 months so uh, in addition to that that 25 million there would be additional orders that would be coming in from the from the new customers or the customers for which we are not supplying right now because of the ecm issue so we do expect that the next year uh, should be a normal year for the for the company as far as the india operations are concerned and uh, you know we should start seeing a good amount of revenue contribution right from uh, q1 uh, up to q4 okay and secondly uh, on the uh, india business uh, we highlighted a bunch of co- con- you know incremental developments on the contract manufacturing side 
Now, how much of that uh, essentially uh, pertain to business from India, and is it largely what a carbogen uh, pipeline that we've highlighted in the in the press release? So one of the products, uh, yes, uh, that that is for the largest product that we have across the group, uh, for which India manufactures uh, four steps. So that is uh, something that would be supplied to carbogen answers for further manufacturing the API, which then goes to the customer. But apart from that, the rest of the projects are, are directly to be supplied from India uh, to the customer. So directly from India or from carbogen? No, the, the rest of the projects which we are manufacturing out of the Babla side, that gets supplied directly from India to the customer. Through Europe or US? Uh, through our marketing facility, yeah. Harshal, my question was in the press release, you mentioned uh, a whole series of, uh, of projects where uh, you know, there is significant progress which is there and there is, a, you know, there is optimism around revenue contribution on those projects from FY22 onwards. So I, what I'm going to ask is how many of these projects uh, would have revenues coming from India and how, much you have, how many of them would be largely uh, conduct, uh, sort of executed out of Switzerland? So as far as the grand new molecules are concerned, uh, right now those products will be supplied from the Swiss entity because those molecules are, are just on the verge of getting approval or have been recently approved. So those molecules uh, would be supplied from the Swiss facility right now, and we are simultaneously evaluating if certain intermediates for those products can be manufactured from the from the India side. So that evaluation is happening right now as we speak. Right. And uh, lastly, uh, on the India business, how much have you guys managed to reduce a fixed cost by with the restructuring that you undertaken? So overall, uh, so majorly the, 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 the biggest uh, cost which we have been able to uh, reduce right now is the employee expenses. So on an average, our employee expenses, which was uh, close to about uh, 7 crores per month, has, uh, has currently come down to about uh, 5 crores. So about 20, 25 crores, 24 crores per annum is a cost saving which has come through on the India business. Right, exactly. So, Simon, so having said that, what, what we are also doing right now is, uh, you know, we are, we are hiring some of the top talent from, from the other pharmaceutical companies in India. Uh, so, you know, uh, as we explained earlier as well, we are going for a little bit more of senior level hiring and, uh, and, and also, you know, kind of replace part of the people whom we have removed as part of the restructuring process. So as, as we see increase in the production over the over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, we would see an addition to the manpower as well. So we're not saying that uh, you know five crores would remain zero uh, time for the next 12 months, but the five could become maybe around uh, six crores. But still, you know, we would see 12 to 15 crores of cost saving over there. Okay. And uh, lastly, Mark, on the uh, new CRAMS projects that you've highlighted in the uh, in the press, press release, how many of them do you expect to get commercialized uh, during uh, FY22? Uh, where you probably start commercial supply starting, and how many of these products going forward? Into uh, a couple, Mitchin. Um The 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 headline one, the, the the big one, which really could be a game changer for the entire business. Um, having completed the validation now. Um, the next supply is going to be the first commercial supply out of the site, nominated as a commercial supply. The validation material is already going into a commercial product, but, but the true commercial supply will be this year. So we come out of validation. We've, uh, we've done very well with the validation, multi-digit millions in terms of the validation work, and that will continue roughly at that sort of level for the next year or so. Uh, in commercial work before it ramps. I mean, the strategy for the customer is very simple. They have uh, two suppliers at the moment of the intermediate. One is themselves, uh, which is the link to payload, and the other is another European company. They want to take themselves out of the supply chain. So they need two external suppliers so that they can take themselves out of the supply chain, and that's us. Um, so we see the volumes ramping if they continue to get the success they're getting in multiple indications. Uh, we see those volumes ramping as per previous guidance within the next three to four years. But certainly the level of revenue will be the same as it was through validation. So, you know, that's, that's, that's really good news for us.
And there's a couple more that will, there's one more that will is already essentially we've completed validation, so commercial supply will probably start towards the end of this coming year. Uh, and then we've got a couple more coming through. So, you know, the turnover in the pipeline is incredibly encouraging, incredibly encouraging. Um, and it's, you know, we've got a pipeline which we've never had before. Frankly, never seen these numbers before. So, you know, we're, uh, we're in a good position. Right. Well, that's good to hear. It's and that last year in the China business? Uh, China, know, China, yeah, we... Um, yeah, China will continue to on its trajectory now. As Hashil said, and Arpit have said, it is now not a drain on the uh, on the resources of the organisation. We have uh, three projects which are uh, slanted to go in there. They are intermediates and larger scale complex molecules that uh, we will use to support uh, API manufacture out of the rest of the group. Um, interestingly, we have had notification that there's likely to be a Chinese FDA inspection this coming year in China. We don't know yet when that is, but uh, that is for a product that uh, a, a European customer is uh, going to be launching in China. And once we get the Chinese FDA, that really does start to open the uh, floodgates positively for us in terms of getting other regulatory inspections. That's the key to China. Uh, the key to China now is to uh, is to get the regulatory inspections, and uh, we have to do that through customers, of course, because we don't manufacture our own products. So that's the game there. But uh, China China is now positively contributing, and it's no longer a uh, a drain on the resources of the organisation. And interestingly, I'll, I will add this from a market perspective: the China new chemical entity development arena is exploding uh, in terms of Chinese companies not doing Me Too products, not doing generics, but actually investing money and time and resources in developing new molecules. Um, and that is something we predicted was going to happen, and it's actually happening. And we've got four or five customers now actively talking to us about doing development work in China for companies who are Chinese startups. So that's happening. That's really happening. And that, again, is an exciting opportunity for our facilities uh, outside of Europe. Uh, very exciting opportunities. Right. Thanks. 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 Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritwik Sheikh from one of financial consultants. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity. So, uh, one question on the Bavla side. Uh, any more re remediation measures that we need to submit uh, to the agency? So, we are, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, on with the CAPA plan, which is a long 50 page CAPA plan that was submitted to the EDQM, uh, which consisted of a lot of things. We are uh, on the work of uh, completing uh, everything one by one, and I think we are about uh, 50 to 60 percent completed. The, uh, the remaining uh, is a time-bound activity, which is um, uh, which is to do with the information technology and the, uh, uh, the the software that we need for, which are 21 CFR compliant software, which we have already placed the orders for, and soon uh, soon uh, the kickoff will happen. Uh, which should be completed uh, in the next uh, two to three months, and in about uh, uh, one or two months after that, it will be going live. But from the perspective of the EDPM or any regulatory authorities, as long as we are moving in this direction, that gives them the comfort that yes, the company is going to take the right step, and hence uh, it, it, it may not delay any sort of uh, uh, approvals uh, which are uh, which are which are based on submitting the CAPA plans. Okay, so so uh, so we need to uh, do the software compliance, which is IT related, and uh, after that uh, we can uh, start uh, production. Is that understanding right? So that is uh, that is uh, the IT related thing is one part of it. We will uh, the remediation plan uh, uh, plant wise. 
uh, is already being uh, taking place where two of the plants have already made the remediation plan and we have started manufacturing of some key intermediates which are required to be supplied to our uh, uh, entity in Switzerland uh, for uh, one of the major APIs and also some uh, uh, other uh, direct customers uh, whom we are supplying these uh, uh, in, uh, key stage uh, materials to and the rest uh, three plants are on the verge of uh, being remediated uh, with the help of the consultants, uh, as mentioned, have, which have come aboard uh, since the past three months, which is going uh, which is, uh, which is uh, going to happen in the next uh, couple of months. And then we will be able to start the manufacturing based on the remediation plan. Okay. Uh, and uh, so on the goodwill, uh, we have about uh, 3,600 crores on the consolidated uh, balance sheet. Uh, so uh, uh, any any uh, tax uh, cash outflow that uh, we envisage the change in, uh, uh, I understand you mentioned uh, that we need to assess. Uh, so uh, does the consolidated uh, impact uh, you know the goodwill in case uh, it is not favorable to us? So, uh, Ritwik, uh, that 3600 crores has two parts to it. One is the goodwill uh, which was which was uh, created on account of the merger, which is right. about 1350 crores, which Correct. is the one eligible for amortization, and that's the goodwill on India business. Okay. Uh, the second part to it, the 2300 odd crores, that's just the goodwill on consolidation. Okay. So, since we have uh, uh, since we have all of these subsidiaries overseas. Uh, the, the, the valuation of the subsidiaries was carried out when we did the merger and whatever was the incremental value to the book value at the time of merger is, is classified as, as part of the goodwill on consolidation. So, so you know, this, this Indian tax ruling has, has no impact on that goodwill. I mean, that would continue and that would keep on getting restated at the closing foreign exchange uh, rate every year. Uh, the 1,350 crores uh, of that 1,100 crores is already amortized uh, under the tax laws, and the rest is something that we we would get a clarity maybe in a month's time or so. Okay, so so basically only 250 crores is uh, possible that we might have uh, to uh, take. Oh, yes. Yeah, about 270. That's not very large. Large. So that's not very large. For exactly. Us. Right. Absolutely. Sure, thanks. And uh, so can you give some timelines on the Switzerland and uh, France uh, CAPEX? Uh, you mentioned that France is just broken ground. So, you know, what kind of CAPEX and uh, what is the uh, timeline for uh, uh, building these uh, facilities? Okay, so the French facility, we've broken ground now. Okay. Um, a lot of the long lead items have been already, uh, commitments have been placed on long lead items. We believe that around about 16 to 18 months will get us to full completion, mm -hmm. and then we'll start trials of um, qualification. It's a parental sterile facility, so it's not an API facility. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a lot of qualification to do. We expect another six to eight months of qualification. So around about two years um, before we're actually generating significant revenue out of the site. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, the pipeline is already growing for that project. These have quite a long gestation period, as Alpit mentioned. So we're already in discussions with uh, customers about the, uh, the scope of the new facility, and they're already looking at uh, how that scope fits their needs in the future. So that's the French facility. Mm -hmm. The facilities that we're building uh, in Europe, these are enabling projects which allow us to uh, extend our capabilities until the new API plant is ready in uh, in Europe, which is going to be about three or four years' time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the enabling projects will last, and there's about six enabling projects which will extend capability and capacity. One of them is directly related to one of the key projects. Uh, the customer is co-funding uh, some expansion of our capabilities to enable them to uh, continue to supply the market. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the priority projects. We believe that will be complete within the next 12 to 13 months. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then we have a number of other smaller projects which will roll through over the next 18 to 36 months. Okay. To bridge so anywhere, the time anywhere from, from facility. Sure. So anywhere from one to three years, uh, these six enabling projects will be uh, commissioned. 
Yeah, that's a reasonable planning scenario, okay. yes. Sure. Okay. And, and what, what we plan to do is to give you a brief update, give the investors a brief update mm. um, every quarter on where we're going with these. But you'll understand they're, co- they're construction projects. Mm. So, you know, from this quarter to next quarter, yes, we've broken ground in, in, in France, but the building isn't going to be built in three months. <laughs> of course, yeah. it's construction. Yeah. So, uh, but we will give, the, uh, we will give the, the market an update on how these projects are moving forward. Okay, sure. And uh, what would be the capex uh, at the French facility and uh, the six enabling projects? <clears throat> Ashok? 97 million total. Yeah, so, so the total capex is going to be 90 million Swiss francs, uh, of which about 7 million has been spent in the, in the third quarter. Okay, so this is cumulative 90 million Swiss francs. For Yes, that's for over phase one. For the phase one. Over three years. So the Swiss, uh, French, and uh, the, the, the IT projects. Sure. The IT okay. projects, yeah. Okay, that, that answers my uh, questions. Uh, all the best and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Havik Mehta from Root Ventures. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, pardon me for my lack of understanding here. So, I'm trying to understand, uh, in spite the EDQM remediation being pending, so the current manufacturing that you're doing for your own facility in Switzerland and for other clients, so is there any specification where you can still do that while you're still under uh, EDQM remediation? No, I think EDQM only pertains to Baula. There is no restriction or limitation on the uh, Swiss or the French uh, expansion. There is no way, no correlation at all. No, no so I mean so from the Baula facility. facility. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand that the current manufacturing which is still uh, happening within the India facility. So that is for oh, which divisions or for which clients which you mentioned. So that facility is still under remediation, right? So uh, whom are you supplying from there? That's no, what my question is. No, no, no. So yes, I understand the question now. So yes, what we have are a couple of facilities which um, are uh, not really subjected majorly to the EDQM. Those facilities we have restarted with new staff and we are manufacturing intermediates and key starting materials. One direct for a customer in Switzerland and it's a Swiss customer. And the other is an intermediate which goes to our facilities in Switzerland where we manufacture with that material the final API and then we sell to the customer. So those are the two key activities going on right now in Barbara, along with you know, a number of other internal projects, uh, some of the quats, some of the disinfectants and some intermediates and things like that. So those are the two key projects that so, are currently uh, running. Is it right to understand that this is incremental revenue other than what would pertain if the EDQM remediation is completed? We would be manufacturing these regardless of EDQM or not. Okay, so like to like, this is completely different, right? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. these are projects that we've had for a number of years, and these are the ones where we're familiar, we're very confident with the chemistry, we've worked with it a number of times, it's a great way to restart the facility and get people back into a proper working mode. And that's why we started to do those, along with the demands of the customers in terms of timelines. Sure, understood. But these purchase and orders were received a long time ago. Okay, understood. And the 160 million order pipeline, uh, does it uh, include the complete uh, functioning of uh, poster equivalent remediation? Or that excludes that no. of order pipeline? No, that's only, that's only the Swiss facilities. Okay. So is there any, so I know it's too early to understand, but once the entire process is completed, what would be the potential revenue from this facility? Which one? The one the, in India? The in, yeah, the one in India. Okay. So, the, uh, so if you see uh, the, the last year, the last financial year, uh, the Babla facility uh, did a revenue of close to about uh, 350 crores on a consolidated basis. So this is excluding whatever gets supplied to Netherlands or to Carbogen and AG. So these are the direct supplies from India. Okay. 
thank you. Uh, my next question is relating to the three programs and enter the late phase three. So is it possible yep. for you to give market sizes of the branded uh, eventual uh, uh, manufacturers? What would be the market sizes for these three specific ones? No, completely impossible. <laughs> One of them's in oncology, um, single biggest unmet clinical need. Um, how big's the oncology market? Well, we all know how big it is. Um, I know what the customer's projections are, but we, we never bank on customer's projections because they're always wrong, either too low or too high. Um, okay. The other two, one of them is difficult, really difficult to say. And if I give you a number, it's going to be wrong. So I'd rather not give you a number because two years okay. later, you'll come back to me and say, ah, you said it was going to be this. But one of them okay. uh, is uh, yeah, actually I showing. Love it. Yep showing some interesting interesting potential in COVID. Um, so the sky's the limit. You just don't know. If we can't... Uh, so I, uh, I understand that uh, it's difficult to project, but uh, given the current uh, wording, it's as uh, complex as it gets. We, it's, we probably cannot fathom what exactly are we looking at. But uh, I'll try uh, again. That, that on the oncology front, at least if you could give the indication for it, well, Which indication is this phase three? The one, the one for the big U.S. customer is yeah. actually a platform for an antibody drug conjugate, and they're using it for three different. Uh, they're using this this uh, payload for three different oncology indications. So one of them is bowel, another one is breast, and the other one I don't know. So there's three indications with that one, and it's a platform. So it's a product that they use in it's a, it's a it's a particular payload and linker that they use in three different indications that they're filing. So okay, okay. So that is for the oncology ADC that you're talking about, right? That's that's for the the new one that's gone into phase three with us. We've been working on this molecule for about five years sure. um, through the various early phases. So that's now going into phase three for one indication. Okay. Okay. Um, the other two, um, it's just so difficult. I'd rather not give you a number because ultimately I'll get killed because it won't be right. The hypoxia one. Uh, so hypoxia I think, uh, uh, okay, so. Effect. Okay. Go, on, go ahead. No, no, no. So my, uh, I, so as with the previous callers as well, so the whole idea is to get us, uh, I think no one, the, the, everyone understands that these are not uh, sacrosanct numbers that you will be presenting. But just to understand the larger market sizes of these uh, drugs, right? It's very important that to understand for an investor that how big are these markets? Are they, I, practically, we all know how big oncology is, and we are working in a subdomain within that. So, uh, we I pretty much appreciate your reluctance to give out these numbers, but. Uh, at least there could be a better way to represent this maybe so just thinking aloud. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I mean I, I could I can give you rough numbers. So so for the for the first one, okay, which is a platform for three oncology drugs for a large pharma company, if that project takes off in one indication, I could imagine that that might be worth two carbogen amsis. It might be worth fifteen million on a on a yearly basis for one indication. Okay, but, you know it's got it's it's got to get approved. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, so and and not all of these get approved. Okay, the other one sure. for U.S. based in, in oncology is for lung cancer. Okay, well, mm -hmm. lung cancer is a huge problem around the world, but specifically in Asia and specifically in China. So. Um, it could be, it could be, I don't know, it could be 30, 40, 50 million for us at maturity. It's just come out of phase one and it's going straight into phase three. We've got another 18 months to two years before we validate that. Sure. Um, so, you know, these are just numbers. I mean, the, any commercial product at a niche scale, and we're not looking at things here, which are what we do is complex, difficult. Um, you know, small volume, very, very rare, difficult to make things. These, these projects, if they go to maturity, could be anywhere between 10 and 40 million a year for us. But in that time period, bear in mind, in that time period, the other products that we've been making are going generic, some of which stay with us and some of which we lose. 
So it's this replication all the time. What we have to do is to re replicate ourselves time and time and time again. Okay. And in replicating ourselves, drive the value higher and higher and higher. And that's what we've been able to do over the last six or seven years with the facilities in Switzerland, is we've been able to replicate ourselves, bring new business in to replace business that has either been lost, it dies, or it's gone generic. But the business that's coming in has been of better value than the previous work. So that's the game that we continually play every year. Sure. Uh, I think I uh, appreciate that. And yeah, else better. Yeah, so I think in future maybe we could uh, discuss more on this. And if I could uh, pull in one more question here, if I'm allowed. Yeah. Uh, I would request you to rejoin the queue, Mr. Mehta. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vishal Manchanda from Nirmal Bank Institutional Equity. Please go ahead. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, on Trans India, I just want to understand. Uh, so once things get normal next year, uh, so uh, would that also mean you would also get to do the backlog? That uh, so there would be there would be demand for FI 21 also that you would need to serve. So would the revenues be much higher than the normal runway, or have the customers got their supplies from somewhere else? Yeah, so we do expect that the uh, that the revenue should be in line with what we did uh, last year uh, at at a minimum, Vishal. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if if more orders come in, you know, it could be even higher. But right now, you know, what we are also factoring in is that it might take another uh, two three months time for uh, the Cramps India business to come to normalcy. So so you know, we are we are also kind of uh, uh, discounting that. In, in keeping out uh, or, or mentioning the numbers. So, so what we can say right now that it would be at least equivalent to what we did in the, in the last financial year. Okay. So These are the orders that we already have on hand. Sorry, Vishal? Uh, so, uh, FI 20 numbers should be the minimum numbers that you would do, and there could be an upside to that. Exactly. Yeah. That's so that, that, that's that's uh, the aim. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm on uh, uh, Cramps Carbon and Amsels. Uh, could you kind of uh, share what will be the constant currency growth this year so far in the nine years? Yeah. So the constant currency uh, growth would be just a second. Please hold on. Without forex. Business growth last year. So uh, the revenue for uh, the nine months was at uh, 124 million as compared to 110 million in the in the first nine months last year. So you know the growth is roughly about 10 percent. Okay. And uh, uh, how so is this growth coming largely from manufacturing or from uh, custom research? So where is this? It's growth both. Coming from? It's both. It's both. But the biggest contributor in terms of of, of true value is is manufacturing. But you need to be doing the development work, otherwise you can't generate that value in manufacturing. So, you know, it's this case all the time. As if you've been listening to what we've been saying for the last few years. We need development work to feed the pipeline. Once we've got the pipeline, the commercial products are the ones that generate the most opportunity. But you never get those chances if you're not doing the development work. And what we are able to do is to generate revenue out of the development work as well. So it's, it's continually re reinventing yourself all the time. That's what we're having to do. The pipeline for, for development work as of December was 94 million Swiss francs. That's our pipeline of unstarted work. And this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, pipeline or order book needs to be executed over the next 12 months. Easily, easily. I mean, <clears throat> I've never seen, and I've been associated with Carbogenamsis for 20 years, I've never seen this level of, uh, this level of interest, this level of commitment from customers 
to uh, to book capacity and to and to reserve resources. Um, you know, our, our order inquiries are what we call an RFP, a request for proposal, is up 10% um, this year. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, which is why we're continuing to invest money to expand our capabilities in Turkey and France because, you know, the market has significant appetite. So I don't see that dropping off. Uh, as far as I can predict, I don't see it dropping off. I see it... Uh, I see it uh, being at that sort of level, if not a little bit higher, in the next two or three years. And, uh, so, uh, can we kind of continue to educate growth with existing capacities in FI22, or we have start, we uh, we need to build additional capacities to get growth in FI22? Well, that's that's yeah, you've you've hit the nail on the head. That is exactly why we're doing the bridging project. The project in France is a very simple simple calculation. We bought that facility nine years ago uh, to understand a bit about formulation. We understand formulation now. That facility was an ailing, losing money. We bought it. It's now making significant money. We know that there's an opportunity in the market for what we're offering, which is why we're spending money in France to expand, to provide more capability and to go further up the value chain. That's an easy calculation. With the with the traditional carbogen answers business, which is very similar to the... Uh, the traditional Dishman business in terms of chemistry. Um, we have capacity and it's people and it's equipment. Okay? We have work now that uh, will basically book out our capacity. Okay? We're turning work away. At that point, when we're turning work away, we want to reinvest. And that's why we're doing these bridging projects, these enabling projects, which are enabling us to expand our, our capacity in certain areas where we see a lot of interest in customers. So that's why we're doing it. You hit the nail on the head perfectly. Okay. So uh, broadly, like uh, if India grants back in FI22, we should also be back to our consolidated EBITDA number, margins number at 27, 28%. So would that also be fair to assume? Actually, it is. Yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, and with uh, more of these projects uh, getting into commercial, the high margin projects, you know, we should see an improvement in the margins as well over the next uh, three years or so. Got it. Uh, thanks. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hirar Bansali, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity again. Uh, my question is from Mark. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, we had, uh, as far as I remember, we had got four uh, molecules, four partner molecules getting approved last year, last financial year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, are there any more molecules approved this year? Unlikely. <laughs> Simple as that, okay. unlikely. And last year I was predicting two to three. So <laughs> okay. it, uh, it really does depend. But I don't think so, not for the rest of this financial year. Um, I think, you know, we've already exceeded our own expectations. Uh, and I think that uh, we, should be, we should rejoice in that, take a breather, because next year is going to be even busier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how many in all uh, are the uh, uh, molecules that are approved in the recent past? Well, in the last three years, probably about seven. Okay. Four of, them being, you... four of them being this year. Uh, two the year before and one the year before that, seven or eight, something like that. I tend not to keep count of the past because I can't change it. <laughs> yeah. So how many, for how many of those uh, seven have we started commercial supplies? Uh, probably, probably five or six, I would say. Okay. So probably five or six. And to preempt your next question, yeah. why haven't you seen an increase in the revenue? Okay, so <laughs> if you go back to what I've always consistently said, yeah, is validation is where we make per unit of product the most money and the most margin. So a recent project, and I won't use names, as you know I, I don't like using names. A recent project during the validation which was about an 18-month project, year to 18 months, generated 16 million Swiss francs of revenue. Okay? 
We've completed the validation and the commercial supply to initially launch is 10 to 12 million for the first year. Okay. So we've already made, we haven't, during validation, we haven't, we haven't made zero revenue, you see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we've already made quite a bit of money. And then what we do is we're then in, into commercial supply, hopefully. And uh, we, we, we then start to generate revenue from commercial supply. The validation is where we make per unit of product the most money, both at top line and at uh, margin. And that's where we do most of the work, frankly. It reflects the fact that there's a huge amount of effort in validation to get things through the regulatory, or, uh, regulatory bodies these days. So when you think about a project, to compare it um, from a value perspective to, the, to our organization in validation versus commercial, sometimes we're actually making a bit less money out of commercial, but commercial is very predictable. So that's why we talk about base load. You know, because if somebody offers me 16 million in one year, but there's a lot of risk associated with it, or for the next five years, 10 million, I'll take the next five years in 10 million because that gives me a base load that I don't really have to worry about too much. There's little risk associated to it. Yeah, but that's the model of the business, right? Yeah. Yeah, so out of the pipeline of 25 uh, um, uh, early phase three and 18 late phase three, how many do you expect to get approved uh, in the next uh, three years? Uh, I would say somewhere in the region of one and a half to three per year. On average, over three years, blended. So please don't come back to me next year and say, why haven't you done four? You did four the year before. It's not in our control, you see. <laughs> no, having done business myself, I know. Understand? I understand. I understand. There are obvious delays in the business. Yeah, one and a half to three per year. So top number could be nine over three years, or it could be, you know, it could be four, three and a half, four. Yeah. So what? What could? I'm basically trying to understand the time lag. So a, a molecule getting approved. Uh, and the commercial supply uh, contract being signed, and then we start supplying, what is the time lag? And, and then, then the molecule reaching, reaching its peak potential. The shortest, the shortest I've experienced in 20 years is actually using validation product for commercial product. And that happens quite a lot, actually. So that's immediate. Basically, you've made your validation product, and instead of that material being sat somewhere and everybody clapping themselves on the back, it's actually going into patients. Uh, and that's an approval that the regulatory agencies need to give, that you can use validation material for commercial use. And that does happen, especially if there's a clinical need. Um, from a traditional route, which is you do your validation, you get the approvals from the client to go into commercial, you negotiate the supply agreement, Somewhere between six to ten months is not unreasonable. Okay. Traditionally, you know, I've seen I've seen commercial supply agreements take two years. I've seen them take two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, it depends how motivated the customer is. And the other side of this, of course, is when somebody gets a commercial hit, especially if they're a small to medium biotech. Ninety-nine percent of the time, a big farmer is going to jump in and either partner with them or they're going to try and acquire the business, and then that changes the map completely. Once a large farmer gets involved, supply agreements can take years. Okay, so that, that's a risk element, you mean to say? Uh, it's a risk element. Um, nine times out of 10, you don't lose the compounds. It does happen. But nine times out of 10, you don't lose the compounds because of all the time. You know, a large company is not going to come in and invest in the small biotech, and the first thing they do is say, all the work you've done before, forget it. All the money that you spent before, forget it. We're going to do it ourselves. There are companies that do that. Hoffman La Roche is one of them. So if Hoffman La Roche acquire a product, we know that there's a damn good chance that they're going to bring it in-house because that's their strategy. They always bring in API in-house, unless it's very old API. Um, but they're probably one of only one or two large farmers that do that. Most other large farmers um, are very used to working with uh, an outsourced model for companies like us. So, you know, but if Hoffman LaRoche acquire a company, then I can pretty much guarantee that we won't be making that API for very long. Mm -hmm. But I can't control that. 
a similar thing maybe happened with Tesaro? Yeah, that was the thing that happened with Tesaro. GSK or another one, yeah. That's exactly what happened with Tesaro. But we made our money. We weren't banking on, we didn't sell our services cheap, hoping that we would get commercial supply. Um, so we, we did okay out of that molecule. Um, it's a disappointment that we didn't go further with it. But our organization did very well out of that. Yeah. And so, what could be the time to peak potential? Sorry, what could be the time for what? To peak potential, peak potential uh, revenue from the commercialized molecule. Uh, if it's not approved for any other indications or, or, or anything like that, probably these things reach peak in three to five years. Depends on the marketing capability of the, the company that owns it. But three to five years is normally peak. You know, and again, traditionally what you tend to get is you get a build-up of supply at the start, you, you know, you maybe use your validation material plus another, plus a, the first commercial batch and you're building stock. And then once you've built stock, you're burning that stock down and you're starting to understand what the market looks like for your product. So you, sometimes you get a little peak at the start, then it flattens off until they understand the market and the market matures for them. And then you've got reasonable predictability. But, you know, let me tell you, I mean, Brinzolamide, which is the product that we make for, uh, for Alcom. You know, that product was, was getting smaller and smaller, and then they started using it in a combination therapy and opened up a couple of other markets, and we're making more brinzolamide than we've ever made. And that product is 27 years old. So <laughs> there's, uh, it, it's, they're, they're always outliers. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that's a norm, but they're always outliers. And these days... Development companies are looking to repurpose old molecules, and we're seeing that a lot, especially with AVCs, uh, oncology, things like that. People are going back into the files and looking at old molecules and saying, how can we repurpose this for today? Because you know, the approval route is very, very quick in that case, which means you can get a market, a molecule to market a damn sight quicker than, than a brand new chemical entity. So you know, market trends are driving that as well. So some of these old molecules are getting, getting fresh life being used in combination with other drugs. Okay, so out of the, out of the last uh, seven molecules that you mentioned that have been approved in the last three years, uh, is there any molecule that has reached a peak potential? Mm -hmm. uh, the last three years? Well, probably not. Probably not. Okay. Now, I'm asking you this from the perspective of uh, uh, revenue gain that might come to Bishman out of it. Well, you know, at the end of the day, as, as Hashil said, if you look at Switzerland and you look at the trajectory Switzerland's on, the biggest single problem we've got today is capacity. It's not the fact that there's no business out there. Um, and what you've seen with the rise in, 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 in money coming into the business is we've been very picky about the sort of projects we've been taking. Um, because obviously, you know, we don't want to tie up our capacity on a project which is only earning 10% EBITDA when we could actually have done a project that's 40% EBITDA. So we're walking that tightrope all the time. Um, and the difficulty is you don't know what these potentials are going to be for commercial going forward. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, not a gamble. I wouldn't say it's a gamble. It's an educated, it's an educated judgment as to which projects you go after. Um, but I think once we've got the capacity and Hashil will be able to give us the numbers um, but once we've got the enabling projects done Hashil what is our, excluding France what is, what is our projection for the increased uh, capacity and therefore the revenue in three to four years time when we've got these enabling projects done so uh, yeah, so the total capex that we will be incurring would be uh, close to about 40 million um, for the for the Swiss side, uh, you know, which would include the enabling projects and the IT projects across uh, across the carbogenesis group, uh, and you know we are expecting close to about uh, 1.5 times as the uh, as the asset term. So you know you can expect close to about uh, 60 to 70 million as the additional that would be coming in because of this uh, capex that we would be doing. The first thing. 
Yeah, and, and you know, and I'll come back to what I said in one of the previous calls. Is this is the biggest single capital investment program that's been carried out in Carbogen Amsis since 2000, well, since 9, 2000, 2001, 2002. Okay. The previous owners put in 100 million to extend, extend the capacity. And through the two recessions we've had since then, we've, we've been focusing on utilizing that capacity. We've done some capex, we've added more labs, we've done some more hypo, things like that. But this is the first time we've really, really made a significant investment to extend the capacity beyond little bits and pieces. And, you know, it's, it's, the business is there for us. That's the message. The business is there. This is less speculative. Um, it's more factual. You know, we're turning business away. And some of that business may or may not be really valuable in five to ten years' time. We just don't know. But we're focusing on what can generate, you know, the, 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 uh, the biggest buck in, the, in a reasonable timeline. Um, and that's where you see the growth, and that's where you see the growth. But we're getting to the point where we just haven't got enough room anymore to put more, more work in. So that's why we need to do this. It's a really nice problem to have, actually. Thank you. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Alfred Diaz for closing comments. Uh, thank you all for the questions. As always, they are truly appreciated and it gives us a lot of insights and directions for the company. Last but not the least, thank you all for your continued trust and faith in the company, especially during its most challenging times and when it truly needs it. As always, we ensure you that we will not let you and it down. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Dishman Coverage and Amsis Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.